good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are uh, on the planet. Uh, welcome to um, day two of the Brain Connectivity Workshop 2021. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you. We have a, a really exciting program today. This is the beginning of the main um, workshop. And uh, just a few uh, things that we would like to share with you, update you on. Uh, regarding the, uh, the workshop itself. We've talked about this yesterday, but in case you you were um, uh, uh, somewhere else, uh, just a couple of, of things. Uh, by default, everybody is muted and the video is off. Um, questions, very important. In fact, when we get to our uh, discussions later on, I will reiterate that a few times. Please uh, pose questions in the Q&A, not the chat, but in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, those questions can be promoted by other attendees. If you see a question there that you find really exciting, you can give it a thumbs up and that'll move it higher in the queue. Uh, we will be monitoring um, uh, the question, the Q&A box, uh, myself and our moderator, Josh Faskovitz, uh, and then uh, uh, try to uh, rank questions and promote questions and get questions out there a little later and have a discussion with you about the, the subject matter of these talks that we're getting to today. Um, everything is being recorded uh, and uh, links to those talks today and, and, and on the other days will be shared publicly uh, later. We will slightly edit uh, these talks and then make them available publicly for everyone to enjoy. Uh, I think that's it for the um, uh, housekeeping notes. Here's our program today and I uh, will uh, start with introducing uh, uh, my dear friend and colleague, Giulio Tononi, uh, who is uh, giving today uh, our um, Wolf Cutter Lecture. The Wolf Cutter Lecture traditionally starts off uh, the program, the main program at uh, Brain Connectivity. And with that lecture, we uh, remember our dear colleague, Wolf Cutter, who uh, passed away much too early and whose passing left a big gap in our field. Um, Dr. Tononi, of course, needs no introduction in some sense, but he'll get one anyway. He is one of my oldest friends and colleagues in the field. Uh, I look back uh, th almost 30 years, actually more than 30 years on our collaboration. Um, Dr. Tononi's work has, of course, addressed sleep and consciousness and connectivity and, 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 and brain function at multiple different levels. And he will tell us today about uh, the, really uh, speak to the main topic of the conference in terms of consciousness and cognition and complexity. Uh, Julio, over to you. Um, uh, and please uh, uh, feel free to share the screen and um, uh, start uh, with your talk. We will give you a full hour and we will record questions along the way. Thank everybody. And uh, say obviously that this year we are going to especially miss the intimate feeling of the very first Brain Connectivity Workshop, Susan will remember that, which was a small hub of friends with very few slides and many questions. But in the days of Zoom, it may be even more difficult to recognize how many threads of this ever expanding workshop are still tightly connected to that initial hub, which is why, you know, this being the Rolf Kutter lecture and Olaf being my chair, I think it's only appropriate to the memory of Rolf and to Olaf to show the frontispiece of the paper that remains, unfortunately, my only official connection to Rolf. I'd like to say that anatomy is destiny in more ways than one, and Rolf saw it earlier than most. Cocomax started in 1996, and it was visionary, both in its goals and its methods of open science. Many, of course, we now take for granted which is a testament to their value. But I think Rawls work is also a testament to the courage of taking small, inevitably inadequate steps, but taking them hopefully in the right direction. And so perhaps as a tribute to those days, I would like to recall some early intuitions about the importance of the link between anatomical, functional and effective connectivity, links that involve in fact the very same friends who gave birth to the very first brain connectivity workshop. So this is an old paper, by old mean really old, 1994, 1995, one with Olaf, one with Carl, in which this idea of the link was explored, this within an area, not across areas. You see a piece of, so to speak, visual cortex with sparse anatomical connectivity, random anatomical connectivity down here, 
and sort of the more mature patchy anatomical connectivity that you find after the visual cortex has developed a grid-like structure. And then of course, in a large scale model at the time in a supercomputer, this was a run producing an interesting dynamic, more or less synchronous. We got a covariance matrix or functional connectivity out of it. And we were interested in looking at how well could this different kind of anatomical connectivities integrate information by a measure of complexity, which is really just a, the average mutual information between any subset and the rest of the network. And you see here the area under the curve is much larger, this complexity measure, for the mature connectivity of visual cortex than for these more immature forms, suggesting that with maturation comes integrated information or something like that. Uh, I want to, as another tribute, so to speak, also mention Randy, who was one of the amigos who started this whole thing, who actually was a very pioneer in the whole idea. He introduced structural equation modeling to brain networks, obviously also very, very long ago, 1994. But this, when we were together at the Neuroscience Institute in San Diego for a while, was also a paper that I think is relevant, certainly to what I will say today, was the idea of searching for subset of areas that might be much more strongly integrated within than without, which we call the functional cluster. And I think this whole idea asks really a core question that will come up again today, one whose significance I think goes beyond devising a particular measure of connectivity, but rather has to do with something more existential. Now, of course, the data here were pitiful, pet data from controlling schizophrenic subjects, but I think the idea is still valid. We did find clustering, two clusters in this case, and within that, a ranking that distinguished between controls and schizophrenia subjects. And finally, I want to sort of end this somewhat nostalgic introduction by pointing to a paper by Olaf, which has the intriguing title Theoretical Neuroanatomy Relating Anatomical and Functional Connectivity in Graphs and Cortical Connection Matrices, which is certainly something that you all know Olaf to, to great heights, collaborating with you know, half of the world or so, here still applied to complexity and functional clustering. But you know, starting this fundamental effort that is encapsulated by the Brain Connectivity Workshop, can we relate anatomical and functional connectivity in a theoretically meaningful way? Can we link graphs and dynamics and eventually brain function? Well, the answer we all know now is certainly yes. And you know, Victor and Randy's visual uh, virtual brain project in humans, the Allen Institute effort in rodents and many others provide, I think, a resoundingly positive answer. But as you know, from my title, I guess, there is another question I believe is worth pursuing. It's not so much about linking anatomy to dynamics and to brain function, but rather anatomy to existence, to the only existence actually that matters, namely our own experience here and now. The question is this, can we account for experience, what it is, why does it feel the way it does, and why it has to do with some parts of the brain and not others? This question applies not just to the experience sort of depicted here that you'll see many times, like you wake up from a nap, say, and suddenly out of nothing, nothing exists. You exist, you experience, your body, your bed, your bedroom, the book in your hands, everything comes back into being. But to any other experience, including that of a perfectly dark sky or a perfectly empty screen, we need to account not so much for functions and for behaviors, that's important too, but if we are interested in consciousness, we must account for why there is something rather than nothing and why it feels the particular way it does. So what needs to be accounted for is experience as such, how it feels here and now in the moment. Now that's of course is what integrated information theory, IIT, tries to do. And crucially it starts from phenomenology, it starts from experience itself the thing that needs to be explained and not from behavioral, functional or neural correlates. And I especially want to emphasize that IAT asks not how the physical world, whatever that might be, or some parts of it gives rise to experience, a locution that you'll find sort of everywhere. It doesn't ask how do we go from physics to phenomenology, but it puts phenomenology first. It puts experience first. How does experience its presence and properties can have an account 
for in physical, that is operational terms, starting from phenomenology and going towards physics. And this is perhaps one of the most important slides, one that is usually forgotten for sure by the end of the lecture, but it's really crucial to understand IAT. The starting point is with Descartes, the fact that experience exists, and that is the only immediate and indubitable fact of all. What it is like to be, if you want to call it like that. And it is always from within experience that we actually posit the existence of a physical world, where physical really is operational, is cause-effect power, being able to take and make a difference, which we establish with observations and manipulation, whether that be a rock, or a Higgs boson or a neuron, it doesn't matter. It's always operation. But remember, without conscience, there would be nothing as far as we're concerned. And it's always from conscience that we need to start. Well, especially if what we need to understand is conscience itself. So now if you start from phenomenology, you may not go anywhere. If that's all you have to say, that you start from phenomenology, there is really no path forward. But IIT does is ask, okay, experience exists, but are there some properties that are true of every conceivable experience, which it calls axioms, the essential properties that characterize every experience? And assuming that we can characterize those properties, can we translate those properties of phenomenal ex existence into properties of physical existence, properties of cause-effect power, such that we can identify those physical systems that can satisfy them and therefore check empirically whether we have some good idea about the substrate of consciousness. And finally, as I think a theory of consciousness must do, we should try to account for all phenomenal properties, none excluded in terms of physical properties. It's all physics and no magic, okay? Experience must be explained purely in physical terms, no magical terms, so as long as we understand what physical should mean, that is operational. And that includes all the specific properties of specific experiences, like why space feels extended, time flowing, objects bind general concepts with particular features, colors feel the way they do and different from sounds, and so on and so forth. So in a, a very short time now, I'll do what I very much hate to do because I can never do it properly, which is briefly describe the essential properties that uh, characterize every conceivable experience, the axiom of IT. So experience exists and every experience has intrinsicality, composition, information, integration, and exclusion. And very briefly, that means that where it's true that every experience immediately and indubitably exists, it's also true that every experience is subjective or intrinsic. It exists from its own intrinsic perspective, so to speak from within. Words cannot really say it properly, but it exists for itself, not for somebody else. It's my experience, so to speak. That's of course true of every experience. Composition means that every experience is structured. It has parts bound together by phenomenal relations, distinctions and relations, we call them. There is a left and the right side of the visual field. There may be a body, a bed, a book, a color, and so on. And they are bound together, the color to the book, the book to its position in space, and so on and so forth. So every experience is structured, and every experience is the way it is. It is specific. In fact, it's impossible to conceive of a generic experience. Nobody ever had a generic experience. Now this may be too trivial to really be appreciated, but an easier way to think about it is that by being the particular way it is, every experience differs from all other possible experiences that you could have had, but you're not having right now. Integration is a property that has been actually characterized before by Descartes himself, by Kant. Every experience is unitary. It cannot be reduced to parts that are experienced separately, nor can the distinctions and relation that compose its structure. Here it's indicated by showing that obviously my visual field is one. It's not just a left visual field and the right visual field independent. If they were, there would be two people, like a split brain patient or so, not one. And that's true of every conceivable experience. And finally, exclusion. Every experience is definite. It has borders and grain meaning it contains what it contains, neither less nor more. Here indicated by saying that the visual field is one, 
but it's one that contains the entire visual field, not just say the left side and not the right side and so on and so forth. But it also doesn't contain more than it contains like extending behind my back. I don't see that, that just doesn't exist for me. And that's true for the distinctions and relation within the experience It's also true for the grain at which experience, so to speak, happens and flows. Now, the next step of IIT, after identifying the essential properties, of course, the ones that are not essential, is to translate these into essential physical properties, operational properties that can be expressed in terms of cause effect power, which means that they must be satisfied by the physical subset of consciousness or PSC, and which is what we can then check empirically. So here again is an overview of the physical properties. Existence is what exists in physical terms is cause effect power, and then intrinsicality, composition, information, integration, and exclusion. And again, just to give the flavor, I cannot really hope to explain this in any accurate way. Here is, you know, existence is again expressed operationally. That means take the brain, take a piece of the brain, take some neurons, let's say these six neurons somewhere in the brain. You can obviously observe and manipulate them. We do this all the time these days with optogenetics, calcium imaging, neural pixels, you name it. Of course, these are operational constructs. And in the end, they really boil down to transition probability matrices. Then in a given moment, every one of these six neurons, here they are just six, they can be characterized by a transition probability matrix at a particular time. And then we can, if we're lucky, summarize that in a rather simple substrate model that expresses the essence of this transition probability matrix. So existence just means there is something can take and make a difference expressed by a TPM. Intrinsicality means that we now choose a particular candidate substrate, say four out of these six neurons here, a, B, C, D, and we leave the other two out as background condition. From the unit TPM, we can get the overall system TPM or substrate TPM. And then we isolate the part that regards these four neurons, the rest is background condition. And what intrinsicality requires that the PSC must have cause effect power upon itself, just like experience is for itself is intrinsic, so must is substrate. And so it must be the case that these units can make a difference within this candidate system, which in this case is obviously true. Now, just like experience is structured, it has parts, distinctions that are bound by phenomenal relations. So it must be with the physical substrate. So now we have our candidate substrate, these just four units, the rest background conditions. But then we require that parts of it also have cause effect power within the system. So this cause of power is structured. And here you see, for instance, you can take individual pieces like the unit A, B, C, D, but also second order mechanisms, two units at a time, third order, three at a time, fourth order, and so on and so forth. And we can then ask, do they take and make a difference within this four unit system? So mechanism D, a single unit in this case, does it take a difference? Yes, it looks like it can take a difference. We check that operationally from A, B, C. Can it have an effect? Yes, it can have effect on itself in this case. And we call that a causal distinction or physical distinction. And then we can ask for all these distinctions, and there are many, whether there are overlaps between these cause purviews and effect purviews. Here there is one BD overlaps with A, B, D here. And we call that a relation, a two relation if it is between two, a three relation among three, and again, so on and so forth. So we actually unfold the powers that a system has on itself for all its parts and all the ways they overlap. The next step, experience is specific, is the particular way it is. So it's not enough to pick a particular set of units as causes and effects purviews. You must specify a particular cause state and effect state, which is indicated here with uppercase for on, let's say, and lowercase for off. In this case, we are assuming binary units. So now suddenly the colors indicate that every physical distinction picks a particular cause and a particular effect. And this is one distinction. There are many others. And each particular relation, this is one, an edge between two, cause, two effects in this case, indicates that there is an overlap between effects inside the system. So once we do this, we begin to unfold in full the specific cause effect power of the system. 
I'll mention before that an experience the way it is and thereby it differs from many other possible ones. Well, that of course is true here too. If we take the substrate in state A, B, C, D where A is off, but then we turn A on, the substrate has changed in state and so does the cause effect structure. Once you unfold it, you get a different set of distinctions and relations in other cause effect structures. So differentiation is also reflected when you unfold a physical substrate. Integration and experience is unitary. It cannot be subdivided into independent components. How do we apply this in physical terms? Well, the cause effect structure must be irreducible to that specified by causally independent subsets of PSC units, which themselves must be reducible and the distinction the relations too. But here I'll just indicate it for the subset as a whole. What we can do is do it partitions, physical causal partitions, say we partition out unit C, and we ask, does it make a difference to the cause effect structure? If it makes no difference, this is not one entity, it's two entities, A, B, C, and A, B, D, and C. But in this case, it makes a difference, which you see here, grayed out are all the distinctions and relations that were folded or killed, if you wish, by this partition. This happens to be the minimum partition, and the quantity phi measures precisely the irreducibility of the cause effect structure, the extent to which it is one entity as opposed to two or more. In fact, a recent development in IIT, an important one, is that finally we were able to find what is the appropriate measure for phi. We had used called by Leibniz divergence earth movers distance before, but because consciousness is the way it is, it's not arbitrary, we knew that it has to be a unique measure and we have been able to prove that there is indeed such a unique measure which satisfies all the postulates of IAT and tells you it's the way to measure integrated information. So this is now possible. And so this is now going to be systematically applied in what is now called IAT 4.0. Let me come to the last postulate. Remember experience is definite. It has borders. It contains what it contains, not less and not more. What does that mean when we unfold the physical substrate? Here we unfold A, B, C, D. I told you it's integrated as measured by phi. But what about subsets or supersets? Here is a subset B, C, D. You unfold it, you get actually a much smaller structure and not surprisingly, the phi value, the irreducibility, the amount of existence, if you wish, of B, C, D is less than that of A, B, C, D. But what about a larger? system, so A, B, C, D, I, in which case we have a larger cause effect structure with more distinction relation just because of the combinatorics. But what about its irreducibility? Well, it turns out that it's also more reducible than A, B, C, D. So this entity cannot exist by a key principle in IT, which I won't go into, which is the maximum existing principle according to which that which exists is what exists the most. And so ABCDI does not exist because ABCD exists more. In fact, we can track, and it turns out in this particular case that ABCD once unfolded is the entity that exists the most, is the one that exists, that is the value of phi max. And the same reasoning applies, of course, to the units, because so far I've said, assume the units are ABCD. But for instance, in the brain and in general, that again cannot be an arbitrary choice. I may be interested in neurons, somebody else in micro columns, somebody else in mini columns, somebody in brain regions and ROIs and you know what else. But the point is, according to IIT, there has to be a grain both in space, molecules, neurons, areas, or in time, 10 microseconds, 10 milliseconds, 10 seconds, and in states, binary on and off, four states, 16 states, 256 states, you name it, and what kind of states, there is always only one answer in IIT. It is whatever gives rise to the maximum value of phi. And in fact, in uh, several papers, we have shown now that against one, what one might in initially imagine is you measure causal power for systems that are composed of micro units, for instance, and then you black boss or macro these micro units into meso units and then you do a further black boxing or macroing into macro units and so on and so forth there is going to be a level at which phi is maximum this is illustrated here with a very fine grain the micro level tpm a meso level tpm a macro level tpm and you can see phi peaking at some intermediate level 
And I think this is a critical question to ask with respect to the brain. We haven't gotten there yet. We hope to be able to devise some appropriate simulation and experimental approach such that we can begin to get a feeling where the say neurons or mini columns are indeed the optimal unit for consciousness, not for other things, but for consciousness, okay? So this leads me to the final you know, theoretical introduction, which is the fundamental explanatory identity, which is proposed by IIT at the end of all of this, which is that an experience is identical to the cause effect structure specified by a physical substrate in a state. In other words, that you unfold from a physical substrate. The quantity of experience, how much the experience exists is given by its irreducibility phi, the quality by the set of distinctions and relation, only a few of which you see here, and this is for just an eight unit system, and the distinction and relations that compose the cause effect structure must correspond one to one to the properties that make an experience what it is to its quality. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And I'll summarize it just by saying that then a cause effect structure unfolds in full the causal powers of a physical substrate in a state at the optimal unit grain. It should account for what I said before for the essential properties that are true of every experience, those five. And it should also account for the specific properties of specific experiences like the extendedness of space, the flow of time and so on. So now, before I you know, end, let me just say that a lot of the work of the past several years has been not only in the theoretical development of the theory, but also a first attempt to see where they can, as a scientific theory should do, explain, predict, and serve as an inferential basis. So here is one of the slides that I often show because you know, at the very beginning, if you have a theory that should explain something about continuity, it should explain basic things. We know the cortex is important, the cerebellum is not, even though it has five times more neurons, it's fantastically complicated, it's connected indirectly to cortex, it has maps, it controls movement, it's involved in cognitive activities. So it's a fantastically complicated piece of machinery, but you take it out and nothing happens. Why is that? Possibly there are some parts of the cerebral cortex that we see that are more important than others. Why would that be and where would the borders be? We also know that many subcortical circuits are important for what we do, say for articulating speech, but they don't seem to be crucial in contributing directly to an experience. Finally, very basic things that we know is that you can lose consciousness early in the night when your neurons are still happily firing along. This is early work by Steriade in the cat, but we've done this in collaboration with Itzak Fried in humans with neuronal recordings of single units in humans in associative areas and they fire just a little bit less than in wake, but you are gone, you don't exist anymore, how come? Or during seizures, for instance, and generalized seizures may be accompanied by loss of consciousness, but neurons fire even more at first and more synchronously. Why is that? All these disparate facts should be explained in a consistent manner by the same theory. And I want to give you just an example of the explanatory power of the theory why cortex and not cerebellum? Well, in the simplest possible way, you see here a little grid of eight neurons, which is like what you find, as we'll discuss later, systematically in the back of the brain. In fact, you find pyramids of grids. This is just work showing that there is a hexagonal lattice arrangement of micro columns in visual cortices, somatosensory cortices, in very much a lot of the back of the cortex. You unfold that and you get a nice big cause effect structure with high five and we understand why now. If you take something instead which is organized like the cerebellum, again, very schematically here, here are the microzones, thousands of microzones in the cerebellum, which are really very strictly segregated modules. They also primarily fit forward and inhibitory on top of that, but they don't interact with each other basically at all. Of course, if you unfold something like that, you don't get one big entity, but you get many, many, many trivially small entities. So that's a very simple, but rather obvious explanation of that difference. But by the same token, we can also explain why the very same anatomy, the one you find in the back of the cortex, like grid-like and pyramids of grids, which is able in the wake mode to sustain a very, very large cause effect structure, can break down when the neuromodulators change and we know what happens. We, what happens is basically that the ability of neurons to interact with each other is much reduced because of the occurrence of bistability and the downstates. And then the posterior cortex here, which should be able to 
support this very, very high phi structure breaks down into pieces that don't look that different in a way from what you find in the cerebellum. And this is empirical work, which now exists both in humans and in rodents. We've done that also in rodents, which shows how intracranial stimulation recordings in a subject awake and then in deep sleep when consciousness is lost show that neurons are active. In fact, they are very reactive to a big response across the frequency band also in sleep. But then there is this off period indicated here by suppression of high frequencies and the breakdown of phase locking such that after the off period, the causal interactions are broken. The system goes back to fire, but it has nothing to do with what happened before. So this is literally as IAT requires that cause effect power is broken by bistability. Now, another important development of IAT, which has sort of consumed the last several years and is going on right now, is, as I said, we need to be able to also account, at least in principle, for the quality of experience, space, time, objects, colors, and sounds. And we decided, and this is work done primarily with uh, Andrew Hahn, to first focus on space, because space is pervasive. Most of our experiences, not all, are spatially extended. We see objects in space, we hear things in space. Of course, our body is spatially extended. We even mostly use concept in space somehow. So space is pervasive, but above all, it is also penetrable by introspection, attention, comparison, working memory. We can sort of penetrate a little bit its structure, which is what, of course, content is about, introspectively, not very well, but a little bit enough to get started. And so the idea is then, can we account for why space feels the way it does. That is, the canvas of the sky, an empty screen, doesn't matter what. What we focus on is not the color, not the object, forget all of that, abstract away from that, is why does it feel extended? And surprisingly, hardly anybody has ever asked, why does extendedness feel extended? People haven't asked, they take it for granted. They think it's a representation of space out there, but it feels that way. It's just as much the hard problem as any color or pain, but it's more accessible. And the idea is that here we can actually account for the phenomenology of spatial extendedness in physical terms. Again, physics and not magic in terms of a cause effect structure. And our conjecture was that a simple grid like 1D here, but in reality, of course, 2D architecture, once you unfold its powers, would actually be able to account for the fundamental properties of spatial experience. And you know, those properties I would have to rush through here are the following. First of all, Spatial experience is characterized by the fact that you can always distinguish spots. It's a term which is rather vague on purpose, but that means you can sort of see spots anywhere and of any size in the visual field. You can, of course, highlight them with attention, but they are all there all the time. And they are related in a very specific way, which is specific of space. According to reflexivity, connection, fusion, and inclusion, meaning that every spot points to itself, not somewhere else, that for every spot, you can always find another spot that's partially overlapping with it, which we call connection, that for any spot, you can find a connected spot such that they are fused into yet another spot and vice versa. And that for every spot, you can always find a spot that includes it or one that's included by it. By the way, these properties are terribly reminiscent of axioms of topology, but also even you know, more basically of set theory. And I believe it goes the other way around. It's because our experience is fundamentally spatial that these properties then were abstracted away by mathematicians to sort of construct the beautiful edifice of mathematics that pervades everything. Well, what we are interested in is if these are the fundamental property of space, we should be able to account for them in physical terms. And we can, if you unfold the grid, you will find that it specifies a certain number of distinctions indicated here. For instance, DE is a mechanism that specifies a cause and an effect on itself, which expresses the reflexivity that you can always find some other distinction that partially overlaps, corresponds to connection. You can always find some other distinction like CDEF, which is the fusion of two smaller ones. And you can always find some other distinction that includes and underneath or is included by another distinction. This, of course, except for the top and the bottom. So this is indicated here, is simple cases in the context of the overall cause effect structure. But importantly, we can then derive other properties of spatial experience, which are indeed derived properties, 
like for every spot, it includes a whole region of space containing all the spots it contains, which are themselves contained at the location of that spot in the overall space. So regions and location, and these are the subsets of the cause effect structure specified by a grid that correspond to a region and the location. You can also identify size and boundary and distance among any two spots. And of course, all the distances are there at once when you look at the screen. You don't need to compute anything. It's all present. All of these correspond to subsets of the cause effect structure. And in fact, a grid is critical because only a grid, if you unfold it, this is another way of representing it, in gold are all the distinctions and consequently the relations that satisfy extendedness. All these four properties are satisfied. Almost all do, except at the very bottom and the top where they satisfy partially. You take a, a system of the same number of units but connected at random, the number of distinctions is high, but basically none of them satisfies extendedness. So grids do it, other architectures don't do it. And that leads to one particular case now of identity that is, we want to account for the specific properties of spatial experience in terms of the physical properties of the cause effect structure specified by a grid. It seems like it works. I invite to have a look at the paper with Andrew Hound on this very issue. And we are pursuing further work now on why time feels flowing and objects feel the way they do. Going back for a moment to neuroscience, this you know, demonstration that grid-like structures can specify the cause effect structure that corresponds to the phenomenology of extendedness that is characterizing space is sort of obviously uh, in indicated by the fact that most of the back of the brain is as we have known from day one in neuroscience is a bunch of maps topographically organized. Now everybody emphasizes that they are maps because of sensory motor transformation, that's how we study them. But first and foremost, they are grids. They're also maps, but they are above all grids, pyramids of grids stacked upon each other. And then, so when we look, just to make the, the, the case here for the phenomenological approach to this, when we look at the visual cortex and the standard approach, visual cortex are first maps of visual space. Yes, we now know there are lateral connections. They have been studied since the times of Charlie Gilbert, and they do things. They do sort of minor things. They provide contextual modulatory inputs. They can perhaps explain some uh, illusions, perceived contrast versus physical contrast. So it's not that they don't do anything, but it's always with respect to some kind of processing across the maps. And if there is no input, they basically have nothing to do. But according to IIT, the lateral connections are not just the glue that keeps the neurons in the grids together, they actually are the ones that even if there is no traffic of them account for the very feeling of space that permeates our experience. And in a recent paper here, we actually show that the distinction between grids and maps is a fundamental one. That's probably why areas in posterior cortex underlie conscious experience of space. Whereas if you take maps, which are also organized topographically like the nucleus of the optic tract, uh, further down in the brain. Well, that can be functionally equivalent. It can actually track, for instance, a light just as well as we can do with cortex. In fact, the two are interconnected. But because it's a map and not a grid, it specifies nothing whatsoever. It's not conscious. We sort of know that. It's reflex. It's a reflex, but why? And that's sort of the principal explanation. I don't want to go through the evidence now that fits with this, except for one example. Based on this notion then, if you are lacking a piece of a grid or if it is inactivated, you're not just blind, you're actually unaware that something is missing, the space is missing, and that's what happens. This is just one case illustrated by Marta Farah for completely different reasons in which there was a occipital lobectomy. And then one thing that was tested before and after the surgery here is how big was space, so to speak, as imagined by the lady who was the patient here. And it was done by asking, you know, when would say a horse and many other things overflow the visual field? So the horse could get 15 feet away and then it would start overflowing. But after you lost one occipital lobe, suddenly the horse started to overflow at 35 feet, suggesting that it's really space shrinks. That happens in split brain. It happens at least transiently in neglect and so on and so forth. I won't go through this slide, but this is work with uh, Chen Song and Andrew Hahn, in which we try to test a very counterintuitive prediction of IIT, which is changes in the strength of connection here in visual cortex induced here by flashing lights, even in the absence, presumably absence, of changes in activity should lead 
to a change in the experience of space, to a contraction of space, which is preliminary as it is, what we actually found. So many more experiments in this line could be done in which we barely check whether we can change connectivity without changing activity. And according to IIT, in the right areas, this should lead to a change in experience. I will now move on to a sort of an easier part, if you are still with me, which is just a brief overview of the predictive power of the theory so far. And one of the main things that probably many of you know that we have tried to do over the years was to test some of the basic ideas of the theory. That is, if content has to do with integrated information, even if you measure it in a very poor man's way, that is by, for instance, perturbing the brain, knocking on the brain with transcranial magnetic stimulation and recording the response, a complex response, a response indicating a system that's integrated and differentiated should be there when you're conscious, which is the case here when you're awake. This is color coded for time. Many brain regions respond in a complex manner at different times. If you do this in the same subject, deep in non-REM sleep early in the night when they lose conscience, the response is simplified and local and disappears very fast. Now this, if you can see this happening sort of a single trial level to some extent from wakefulness to stage one to falling asleep, this complex response simplifies. You can see this is a much more difficult experiment to do that we did to test the theory, going from wakefulness to early non-REM and then to REM sleep in most of the time you dream. So you are conscious even though you do nothing and you are disconnected. And indeed the response simplifies in non-REM and gets very similar to wake when you are in REM. And then we did several anesthetics. This is mostly the work now of Marcello Massimini and his group in Milan and people in Belgium in which, you know, awake, complex response, different anesthetics, midazolam, high dose, propofol, xenon, you get a simple response suggesting loss of integrated information. And then ketamine, that was a critical test. You are unresponsive, we can do surgery on you, but at the right dose, you actually have very intense, vivid and long dreams. And that happened in our subjects and the response was complex as you would expect. So it's caution is not responsiveness. Now, uh, Marcello has also been able to confirm this intracranially in humans by doing intracranial stimulation and recordings. Again, same kind of response. Now it's done both intracranially and extracranially. I will not show the movie for lack of time. We now see this in rodents where sometimes it's very difficult to assess consciousness objectively independent of behavior. So this is neuropixel recordings. We're going through all the way from M1 to hippocampus, thalamus, and hypothalamus. And we stimulate, in this case, electrically, in another case, optogenetically. And you see the response in wake, this big biphasic response in non-REM. Then REM is more complex than two anesthetic sevoflurane and dexmedetomidine. And here you see the unit responses across the depth of this is just cortex, otherwise we would have the depth of the entire brain, but I'm not showing that. And you can easily see the off period, now for the first time we can actually show that the units are silent, the off period triggered in the superficial layers of the cortex, a bit also in deep layers by the stimulation, whereas that doesn't happen, you get complex firing patterns in wake and REM. And this PCI ST index is basically a number that can be applied to this recording to get a sense whether complexity is high, low, high again, and then low with the anesthetics. So this can now be done in rodents. Sean Hill is one of the organizers of this meeting too. And here is some work we did a long time ago with a large scale thalamocortical system with three layers of cortex, three areas, and then reticular thalamic nucleus and specific thalamic nuclei. In wake, you get this tonic complex activity. In sleep, when you change the neuromodulators, you get bistability. You get up and down, up and down, firing is still there but it breaks causal interaction. And that's why TMS becomes simplified. And this is now work over many years uh, uh, from Madison and Milan in which you, and, and uh, Liege, in which you see that subjects, healthy subjects have PCI values indicating high complexity when they are awake and conscious. They also have them when they are under ketamine anesthesia or dreaming. And then neurological subjects with various kinds of lesions also have high levels. The only case in which this value is low is under propofon, xenon, midazolam anesthesia, or early non REM sleep with very, very high sensitivity and specificity. There's really nothing like it. And that can then be applied to patients where you really would like to know whether they are there or not. It's very difficult neurologically to assess that. Good neurologists can be reasonably good at evaluating the minimally conscious state, plus or minus, and usually that is a high PCI. 
But then you've got these guys who are vegetative or you know unresponsive wakefulness that clearly stratify in three groups, green, blue, and black. Black, they have zero PCI. There's nothing there, no responsiveness to knocking at the brain. Probably these people are not there and there is no hope to get them out. The blue ones have a response not that different from anesthesia or sleep in healthy subjects. And that suggests maybe these are subjects that could benefit from restoring excitability through DBS or drugs. And finally, the ones who are green, who have a high complexity like we do in wake or dreaming, those could be candidates for restoring communication, say through brain machine interface. So there is a practical application of what started really as a pure theoretical undertaking to test the theory. I want in this group here to present data that we've been analyzing for far too long and they're not yet published, but we took advantage of the high quality data of the human connectome project, seven Tesla, three Tesla, and we went on purpose at the voxel level. It's still not good enough, but it's better than nothing. You know, 64K voxels basically, and then trying with many, many assumptions to approximate the value of five for the first time in a way that can be sort of applied reasonably to fMRI data. And the main test was whether indeed, depending obviously on the architecture, these values would be higher in some part of the brain rather than others. This is a logarithmic scale. Sorry, this didn't come out right, but it's very high in the back. It's very low in the front. And of course, these are very, very crude subdivisions, but it's still telling us something. It's terribly low in the cerebellum. And notice that's very important. It's low if you take the brain as a whole, in this case, phi actually is not growing because if the complexity is uh, you know, subject to the key trade-off that is due to the trade-off between expansion and dilution, that is a consequence of how phi is defined based on the postulates. Indeed, you have to be tightly interwoven to have high phi. It's not enough to be big with lots of connections. And this is just to indicate that at least in the seven Tesla data, the areas if, where we find the maximum likelihood of a voxel to be part of this main complex, this particular set of regions that is very tightly integrated within and not without, this is based on phi, but it reminds you of the functional clustering slide I showed you from 98 with Randy McIntosh. Well, that is primarily in the back across 160 subjects. And it doesn't change too much, but it does change. When you do movie watching, you add some auditory and visual areas. So it's an important question that we have asked in the past. We don't know the answer yet. Can this complex shift a bit depending what you're doing, maybe due to attention or not? Notice this is three Tesla now, it still fits. We can still see the same kind of regions when subjects are performing six kind of tasks and it has nothing to do with which areas are activated in the tasks. This is the ones that hold highly, tightly together, not the ones that get activated. So there is a dissociation there. I'll finish now by saying, well, if on purely theoretical ground, this was from first principles, integrated information, we don't know anything about where consciousness resides, so to speak, in the brain, or rather how the brain can account for consciousness, but is that empirically a reasonable idea? And so for quite a while with Francesca Sicari, Ben Baird, and Lampros Perogandros, we try to use what we call a within state, no task paradigm to avoid the confounds that usually happen when you're comparing sleep and wake, anesthesia, and so on, which is get subjects who are asleep. The state is roughly the same. The brain is very, very similar from what we can see superficially. Sometimes you dream, you're conscious, and sometimes you don't. That never happens in wake. Okay. And then we ask about the last 20 seconds because those are the ones we can correlate best with high density EG. And the result of this work very clearly show that the areas of the brain where we find a difference between dreaming and not dreaming, consciousness and not, are mostly in the back. The difference is that there is little delta activity that is presumably by stability in these areas in the back when you are dreaming in non-REM sleep. And there is delta when you are not dreaming, again, in non-REM sleep. Importantly, if you go to REM sleep, which is very different on the surface and by the high density EG recordings, and the few times in which you don't dream, you're not conscious in REM sleep, same story. The very same areas show some delta activity, basically, when you are unconscious. Okay, so this suggests that somehow the substrate empirically in a within state, no task paradigm, seems to be primarily in the back. Now, this is just uh, one of many other studies I could show. This is from the group of Patrick Purdon, a recently recent one with propofol anesthesia. 
baseline and sedation consciousness uh, caution is still present in these subjects. You see not much changes, but when they go unconscious for the first time, which is at the low dose here, you see this red, it's all in the back, and that indicates the occurrence basically of activity that is time blocked to the occurrence of slow waves. So when slow waves invade the back, you lose consciousness and the front is invaded much later. This is a slide of old and a little bit newer stuff. Lesion data, lesion data have always suggested in my mind that you can take out most of prefrontal cortex. This is a radical case, Brickner's patient in the 30s, they took out all prefrontal cortex on the right, all but Broca's area on the left and studied the brain for years and studied the patient for years. There's a book about him. What happened was that he had a frontal syndrome, which by the way, the luminaries at the time, like Penfield and Hebb, disagreed with. They thought there was no change whatsoever. He had a frontal syndrome, but obviously he was just as conscious as you and me. And if you look at lesion data in the literature, but much more should be done, traumatic brain injuries that affect the posterior cor corpus callosum and associated regions, you never get out of it. You never recover. And also anoxic lesions now, and these are case report, and this is a group report that involve the posterior part of the cortex, occipital and parietal lobes also have basically no hope of recovery. Okay, so that lesion data fit. This is a recent very nice meta-analysis of Fox et al in which, you know, if you look at where you get some change in the experience from phosphines to some sensory experiences, et cetera, et cetera, stimulating all over the brain, the red stuff where you get something, the eloquent cortex is primarily again in the back. So I think both recording lesion and stimulating experience suggest that posterior cortex broadly intended, I'm not ruling out some pieces of prefrontal cortex or ruling in some pieces of the back, seems to be particularly important for consciousness empirically and that's where maximum phi seems to be both empirically and from a theoretical point of view. So I want to finish the last five minutes or so by exploiting the theory, assuming it, you know, it continues to be validated both on the big picture of presence and absence of consciousness and its location in the brain, but also in terms of can it account for the quality of experience, space, time, object, and so on. Assume that were the case, then one can use a theory rather than one's guts feelings, good as they are, to figure out difficult questions. Are animals conscious, conscious? Is an octopus conscious? An octopus is my favorite because it has eight brains on top of the central brain. There could be no octopus, there could be one octopus, there could be nine octopi, or there could be eight. Nobody knows that. And a priori, it's very difficult to know. What you need to do is get the anatomical connectivity, put in some physiology, unfold it, and see whether it can give rise to one or more complex of high five. Organoids, another example, now they're becoming more and more sophisticated. There are cortical structures by and large that are not identical, but they can be in a dish for a while, very big, if you give the right neuromodulatory cocktail, they sort of come to life, meaning they fire tonically and so on. Are they conscious or not? You can't say that based on your gut feeling. You need to have a theory which is validated about what consciousness is and what it takes to have it. Or go to collective consciousness. Or very, you know, often people talk about the fact that maybe if we engage in special meditation practices or some drugs, we may fuse with the universe or whatever. Okay. Is that at all reasonable? Well, IIT tells you that if you are there, the group is not there because of the exclusion postulate. So no, but it's something that in principle can be tested. If it turns out that a collective can have higher phi than me when I'm right now conscious, the theory is wrong. And finally, and most importantly, I think, and most urgently, computers. Okay, Talking about anatomical, functional, effective connectivity, I think computers become extremely important because assuming that IIT is roughly right, we can indeed prove that a powerful general AI, artificial intelligence, or even a detailed simulation of one's brain, certainly far away now, will remain unconscious in any meaningful sense. So this paper is not yet out. This is work by Graham Finlay and Billy Marshall, because we are waiting to finalize IAT 4.0. But the basic proof hasn't changed at all. You can take a little system of four units like this, which you know, could be four neurons interacting in some way. If it has the right anatomy, like a little grid, you unfold it and it would have some consciousness. It's a complex of some value of phi. You can build, in fact, they built a universal computer, a little one, but it's actually much more complicated. It's got 66 units with clock and memory registers and the ALU and CPU. And that is able to simulate perfectly forever 
the behavior of this. So the input output is the same, they are functionally equivalent. But once you unfold this architecture, it's dust, as I call it. There are small pieces that have this minimal value of phi, like uh, you know, much worse than the cerebellum, if you wish, but there is nothing it is like to be a computer, even though from the outside, it behaves exactly like this other system. So once you put it in a box and you give the computer, you know, the very, very same functions, which in principle is achievable as we, okay? So the computer behaves exactly like you and me has the same cognitive function as you and me, but if it is implemented in a computer, IIT says that there is nothing there. It is indeed just a tool, is just a substrate and is not an entity, okay? And this leads, of course, to a double dissociation in the end between consciousness and intelligence. We've shown that actually, Selective pressures sort of explains a little bit by why your intelligence and consciousness would go together. It's good to have integrated circuits. You can pack many functions over a smaller hardware. But in general, now we are at the stage in which we can dissociate them. We can create very intelligent machines that can do all the things we do or better that have zero consciousness, as I've just shown you. Or we can have, in a way, very stupid entities like organoids that are not even connected to the environment they are just lying there and doing nothing, which nevertheless could be even highly conscious, maybe in a special manner. In fact, you know, in experiments we are doing with deep meditators, this is work with Milani Boli, when they get to a state, which is very difficult to achieve, of pure presence in which objects are gone, the self is gone, thoughts are gone, etc. Basically, the state of pure being, it's being without doing. Well, the prediction here, there would be very little activity in the brain, and yet you don't need activity to be conscious if you have the right anatomy. And of course, neurons are not inactivated. And if you look at this, this is now many, many meditators from different traditions. This is Zen. These are the frequency bands from delta to gamma. And this is the depth of meditation compared to mind wandering. This is pure presence at the bottom. Pure presence, the only thing that changes really is powers goes down in all frequencies, especially gamma, as if the brain was very quiet. Of course, we don't have epileptic meditators yet, but as if the brain were very quiet and at the same time, consciousness is very vivid. In fact, it's described usually as a great spatial extendedness, some, somewhat luminous. So I'll finish with going back to what I said at the beginning. My goal was not to link anatomy to dynamics to brain function, Important, of course, as that is. Rather, it was to link anatomy and physiology, of course, a physical substrate to what actually exists here and now in the most fundamental sense, that is experience. Can we account for experience, what it is, why it feels the way it does, and why it has to do with certain parts of the brain? Can we explain why certain parts of the brain and not others are important, why space feels the way it does based on certain architectures in the brain and time and objects? Well, I think we can, although the pursuit, of course, is just beginning. It will get, need you know, good anatomy and physiology, that's for sure, a high dose of mathematics, that's even more sure, and ingenious experiments. But what we should do then is not just derive dynamics or functions from an anatomical connectivity, but actually unfold cause-effect structures from TPMs of the cortex and the cerebellum, the front versus the back of the cortex, grids and pyramids, brains and computers, and then see what actually exists. Because what exists is really the only kind of existence that matters in the end is intrinsic existence, which is experience itself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julio, for this fa fantastic, uh, truly mind-bending uh, talk. And uh, what a great uh, kickoff to our day-to-day -day and to our uh, really topic of the workshop. Um, I suggest that we, we do spend a few minutes on questions. They have been pouring in. I have been monitoring them uh, as we went along. I would like to um, uh, try something here. We have a question from uh, actually a little discussion thread uh, involving Thomas Varley, Andrea Bovelli, and Stefan Krohn. Uh, if one of you would like to uh, uh, raise your question, can you please raise your hand? And I will try to give you the microphone, um, if that works. Um, uh, raise your hand. I should be able to see that happening. Uh, OK, uh, I'm going to. See if I can. Uh, Thomas, I think you are unmuted. Can you can you um, can you speak? Uh, testing anybody? Yes, you can uh, go ahead with your question, please. 
Hi, um, thank you, Dr. Tanoni. This is a fascinating talk. Um, one question that I have is I'm still a little bit fuzzy on how you're sort of operationalizing causality here, right? You know, you start with these TPMs that describe statistical regularities, but I'm not entirely sure that um, I buy that they are necessarily causal. Could you sort of unpack that a little bit more? There was some discussion um, about uh, Pearl's do operator and whether it makes sense to talk about maximum entropy uh, interventions in the context of ongoing brain dynamics. And I think broadly, this is a topic that is worth um, addressing a little bit more. Yes, of course. And uh, in fact, you know, I point you to a set of papers with Larry Salbantakis as a first author, which deal explicitly with the issue of causality. In fact, it's the opportunity to say that the very same postulates that you see for cause effect power, which you could call potential causation, meaning the powers of a substrate at a given time, are applied to asking the question of what caused what. Going from T minus one to T zero, you can ask actually take, let's say a neural network at time T minus one, at time T zero, in two observed states, and then systematically uh, get the answer to what cause what. And the cause is going to be compositional, it's going to be integrated, it's going to be specific, definitely, and all that. So it will fit all the same postulates and it actually deals with many of the classic issues that say in, in the philosophy of causation have been raised, starting with very basic things people typically ignore, which is there is a cause side and there is an effect side, even in actual causation. It's not the same to ask what caused this from T minus one to T zero and to ask what is the effect of this from T minus one to T zero. Those are two different things and typically they are not the same answer. There are many other things like that that are very important, including exclusion that allows you to tell whether a cause ends here or goes on forever, including, for instance, the, the involvement in cosmic rays in a car accident, okay? The law knows very well that that doesn't make any sense, but actually exclusion gives you a reasonable answer as to why a cause should end where it ends, again, by maximizing cause of efficacy. The issue about causation as such in the philosophical sense, which is where you started from, is something I am not going to discuss now, it would take forever. And let me just say that indeed the TPM has to be a reliable TPM, so it has to be repeated, and we are assuming a certain stability of the substrate over the time of observation. We're also assuming what I call an atomic hand and an atomic eye, meaning it's all operational. You've got tools by which you can establish causation, but just like you can reliably observe that the glass on my desk, I can lift it and drop it, lift it and drop it, the same can be done, including, as I said, for Higgs boson. So much more needs to be said, I will be happy to discuss that with you, but I encourage you to look at these papers with, with Larissa Albantakis, including one that deals with the philosophical issues of causation. Thank you very much. I see a question here from Dan Lurie. Dan, if you are in the audience and can raise your hand, please do so, and I can uh, give you the microphone. Over to you. Dan, Dan you should be able to talk. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks Olaf and uh, thank you uh, Julia for that really great introduction um, uh, to, to IIT and some of the more recent results. And this is a question that um, uh, has been asked, I think quite a bit in the in the IIT literature. I think there was a dual perspectives in, in Journal of Neuroscience about it a while ago, but it's something that I still think about, which is that the topography of the results that studies on IIT show generally show as you were as you were mentioning, these posterior regions. And these are generally the same reasons that we in cognitive neuro in systems neuroscience generally associate with representing external stimuli or at least attending to them. And I'm wondering if that has, if you think that has to do with the fact that many of our subjective experiences are of external stimuli and that those are the ones that we can experiment on. Um, and if you would expect that the regions um, forming the, the 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 integrated component would be different if we were dealing with a subjective experience that was purely kind of internal, more like a, or autobiographical memory, or uh, a, a thinking of certain of concepts that don't necessarily have a, a an exterior binding. Yes, well, far too many things to address here, and all very interesting. So beginning with the notion of representation, which is something that definitely I don't like. All meaning is intrinsic in IIT. And in fact, you know, much of the data that I showed, this within state uh, 
a no task paradigm were about dreaming. So in that case, while obviously that's not necessarily the, you know, the, the goal of your question, all of that is experienced whether or not, in fact, in that case, not, you are connected to the external environment. So the experiences are there without any need to represent anything that's happening at the moment. Of course, you have the brain you have because of a long phylogenetic, ontogenetic history, and then learning dependent changes in plasticity, which is why in the end, we know this very clearly for grids in V1, in mice, it's very clear this has been proven. You start with no connections, no cortical, cortical connection, then you actually get a random connectivity and then it gets refined into a grid-like connectivity and then of course orientation and directional selectivity and all those things and presumably although nobody knows this for sure this percolates higher up when you collect and you discover more suspicious sequences and coincidences in the inputs and you apply plasticity so yes of course the external world has a key role in molding the architecture of especially the back of the brain into what we normally have. The IAT view of that a little bit is that it's the fundamental anatomy of much of posterior cortex, but it could also be part of insula or elsewhere, that is key because this is theoretical work that's still going on. Grids and especially pyramids of grids, which is really all that you do when you do say machine learning, are ideally suited for high values of phi. Whereas instead, if you have random network or modular networks, uh, that is much less so. And there are good reasons, precisely because the back of the brain is connected to 2D sheets or 1D sheets that sample the world in a way that in, it is very sensitive to spatial and temporal correlations, that those parts of the brain then could support very high phi. There is another question that you're asking, which I'm just to touch upon a couple of these issues, which is about sort of what sometimes is called intrinsic and extrinsic, but I definitely don't use that in IIT because intrinsic is all of consciousness when you dream. But if you are thinking about something, for instance, only thinking, versus whether you are experiencing you know, something on your body or something out there in the world. So we do have actually a study, a SDG study, in which we looked specifically at the neural correlates of thinking versus perceiving. And that was done taking advantage of the fact that that happens in wake, but that's typically confounded by all kind of task related stuff. It also happened when you are imagining things and daydreaming. It also happens when you are dreaming and in both in non-REM and in REM dreams. And by looking at all these states simultaneously, it's actually possible to focus on the regions that are critical. And not surprising, there is, we actually published this, a gradient, more perceptual like dreams, for instance, but also of course experiences during wake are where you would expect in you know, posterior cortical areas and so on, but less so, for instance, in mid singular cortex, whereas pure thought, also when you have experience that can be characterized primarily as thought, is more mid singular cortex. I can't be more precise because this is identity G source modeling, so it has its limitations. So the well, key, key question to ask is whether what we call the main complex, so the set of regions that has a maximum of phi, is shifting when you're doing a pure thought, for instance, will it shrink to you know, mid-singular and some related regions, or will it stay largely the same, maybe losing V1, V2, or something like that? That's an open question. And it's actually a tricky question because it's all dependent on maxima in IIT. So it's not that you can make trivial predictions sometimes. It really depends on attentional modulation. So it's a full, interesting area for discovery, I believe. Thank you very much for that question and answer. And uh, we have a little leeway with, with, with respect to our break time. So I, I, I do not want to cut things off quite yet. Uh, Enzo, do not worry. We will simply push things back by a few minutes. Last question coming from the panel uh, from Victor uh, Yerza. Uh, Victor, uh, you typed your question in the chat. Uh, and uh, would you like, I think you have access to the mic. Uh, uh, could you like to, uh, to ask your question? And, um, and that's the final one. Let's make it a couple of minutes, please. Uh, so go ahead, Victor. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Olaf, yeah? Uh, yes, very good, yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, Julio, thank you very much for this uh, lovely talk. Question, uh, goes to the uh, assumption, no, uh, is uh, with regard to reducibility. Yeah, 
uh, irreducibility that you have applied, that you have convincingly demonstrated when dealing with the various axioms linked to the phenomenology of consciousness. There, in particular, there is an underlying assumption to the attribution of discrete uh, values to the uh, variables that you're looking at, on, off, yes, on, uh, yes, no, uh, aspects like this. So continuous versus discontinuous uh, attribution to the values of the uh, variables. To what degree is that actually constraining the possibility of uh, uh, excluding higher order structures that could be potentially reducible to some of these uh, uh, properties that you axiomatically uh, described, however, could have on a higher order level a explanatory uh, uh, power. An example that I put in in the chat is uh, if we think of a bistable system composed of two uh, stable states, so they are separated typically by a well, so you would have the property of divergence. Uh, the stable states are stable, so they would have the property of convergence. Uh, they could, uh, sitting on the fixed points, you have stationarity versus non-stationary. So you can actually describe it by a set of properties and build structures out of this. But if you think of the bistable or double well system, you would have a much simpler explanatory construct uh, providing you uh, access to an understanding uh, of uh, what you actually want to describe yeah but it would be reducible have you considered possibilities like this and that deeper question behind that is continuous versus discontinuous variable yeah so somehow zoom is going in and out I'll to be brief first the discrete versus continuous in iit is Oh, you are breaking up. I don't know if that is uh, now. We, we. It appears we have lost. Oh no, there, uh, Julio, you're at the bottom. Of the Coming in and out, and he's saying Zoom had a problem. Okay. Nevertheless, oh, okay. I, am I there now? Yes, you are. Yeah. So it is discrete in the sense that, as usual, the physical is operational. So we are going down with this atomic hand and atomic eye, and what we get is a discrete sample, okay, always. And it's all based on that. The second question is why I was trying to share my screen is could you build, for instance, macro units or macro intervals or macro states out of micro units, intervals, and states? that themselves, for instance, might not qualify, okay? And that's the whole thing. Those three papers, I'm, you know, I, won't not, I will not try to share now because <laughs> it, it crashed the system, but those various papers on macro versus micro, which we show that the macro can beat the micro, are accurately indicating that depending how the system is organized, okay, depending if you wish on the substrate model, you do have that some meso level, for instance, uh, units, intervals, and states, may have greater causal powers than anything finer or coarser. Okay. And so the assumption is you always have a bottom level, which cannot be you know, less than. And then on top of that, you will find whatever level maximizes fine. So whatever exists is what exists the most as the maximum existence principle. And it implies discreteness. It actually implies that things are finite, by the way. It rules out that there can be something that's not finite. Okay. And it tells you that there is a particular grain of nature, both of entities and units, that excludes everything else. Extrinsically, we can check everything, every level, every perturbation, we can do all things we want. But intrinsically, only one particular grain exists and only a set of entities exist. There is nothing else. Okay, I would love to have this conversation at greater length, but I don't want to intrude on Enso, and so maybe we'll continue this on a beer. Thank you. We could, we could uh, have done that if we were in the real world, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this, this was a great a little exchange.